So, um, um, so first of all, I really have to apologize for not having graded the first assignment yet. I mean, I don't know when that's going to happen. Um, uh, maybe over this weekend. I know, obviously, it would have been really good to have it back before uh, the second assignment was due. That's the whole reason there's two assignments even. But, oh well, I didn't manage to do it. I also wanted to go over the final paper assignment. Um, so, uh, which I just put up this morning. Um, so, let's see, is there anything that here is worth going over? Um, it's four to six pages, double space, due Wednesday, June 14th. Um, so like this is unlike the first and second writing assignments, this is not a uh, like answer my question. I mean, I feel like in this course the boundary between these things is a little more blurred than usual, but still, this is the so what they, they what these prompts are is not questions you're supposed to answer, but like suggested topics together with various like suggestions about ways you might think about the topic. Um, so like some of them are really really long, you know, that's. That's actually, that's a good thing, right? Like it doesn't mean that you have to answer every part of this long thing. It means that there's like more suggestions for how you might think of something that you want to um, argue for. Um, um, and, uh, as I say, like my intention or recommendation is that you should write about more than one of the people that we studied. Uh, probably, probably you can't write substantially about more than two. So that probably means two. I mean, given that it's four to six pages. But, um, but as I say here in the instructions, like sometimes it can help to say just, you know, to just briefly mention someone else right so uh, you know it's basically like whatever you think will make your paper better <laughs> um uh, uh i'm not recommending that you use outside material uh but you can if you think it helps uh if you um I mean, I guess especially maybe more in this course than in other courses you might want to mention like background facts, you know, like historical facts, whatever. Uh, um, so, you know, if you look those up in Wikipedia, you know, cite Wikipedia, whatever. Um, uh, um, yeah, so, but anyway, if you use any outside material, obviously you have to cite it. Um, and as I think I said at the beginning of the course, please don't plagiarize. I didn't really. Um, please don't have chat GPT write your paper. Only because that, I've dealt with chat GPT quite a bit and it can be, like, I think it would be annoying to read a lot of papers that it wrote. So please don't do it. Um, uh, um, oh, okay, now there's two people here. <laughs> um, so, um, right, so uh, in most of my courses where there is a final paper, I say that the, the intent of the paper is to talk about the views of the authors we read not 
like as opposed to about your own opinions about a subject. So, um, right, like, you know, uh, does Descartes think the world exists? Not do I think the world exists? <laughs> Um, uh, in this course, I like I changed that instruction a little bit. You know, I said at the beginning, look, this, you know, the topics in this course are all like personally relevant to us. I it probably would be hard to, to completely keep out your own feelings or opinions, but still, I'm suggesting that, that the, the, you know, main point of the paper should to be interpret the things we've read and compare. Um, um, at least two of them to each other. Um, so, you know, uh, it's basically like what I do over and over in every lecture, sometimes well and sometimes not, but <laughs> um, I'm just asking you to try to do it once. <laughs> um, so, you know, like it's not easy to say what these people mean and how they agree and disagree with each other or are otherwise related to each other. I guess there's other relations besides, besides agreement and disagreement that might be interesting. Um, so, uh, you know, it's not easy to say those things. It's like um, meaning, therefore, if you do find something to say about it, that will be something you can argue for, or try to um, show why you think that. Um, um, and I also said at the end of that instruction, that um, that paragraph of the instructions, that if there's something in one of our authors that you just really can't stand, and like you think it's stupid or ridiculous or offensive or whatever, then, you know, I mean, that can be uh, impetus to writing some something interesting, but only if you, I think, well, I don't know if I should say only, who knows, but mostly because mostly it helps to write something interesting if it gives you like an impetus to try to figure out why someone would say this, right? Like if it, so, I mean, because, like just ranting about how bad this person is is not probably going to be interesting. Um, um, probably, I don't know. There could be exceptions to that. Uh, um, but that's my recommendation. So and my recommendation is that if you can't manage to get enough distance to say, okay, like, this seems really wrong to me, but I'm going to try to understand why they think this. Then you should like you should write about something else. <laughs> um, fortunately, we have fortunately and unfortunately we have a ton of material to write about in this course, so uh, you should be able to find something else. Um, and yeah, I'm not you know. As usual, I'm not trying to teach some format of citation or like I don't expect uh, separate bibliography or, you know, I mean, you can do that stuff if you want, I guess, but <laughs> I'm not looking for it. Um, but, you know, so if you do, if you, if you are quoting texts that were assigned for the course, then you can just give the title and the page number. Uh, if you cite something else, then just somehow or other give me enough information so I can figure out what you're citing. Um, okay. And as I said, there's a, there's a list of suggested topics here. I'm obviously not going to go through them all. Um, but uh, if you look at them and you have questions about them, or if you already looked at them and you have questions about them, um, just uh, let me know. Um, and once again, these are suggestions. So like if there's something else, you know, like I know that uh, there's one student who's really interested in education, like education isn't, I mean, 
might be hard because I didn't focus the readings on that, even though like I could have definitely with some of these people at least. Uh, but you know, that's not one of the suggested topics. But if you want to write about that and you think you can, uh, you know, go ahead. Um, okay. Um, are there questions about that, about the final paper assignment? From the Zoom land. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I guess there's really no reason for me to wear a mask since there's no one here. <laughs> Let's take it off. All right. Um, okay, so Viola Cordova, Viola, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Um, died in 2002. Um, um, we're still alive today. Um, yeah, should be getting up there in years. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, I'm not going to say a lot about her biography because uh, a large part of the assigned reading is about her biography. That is, she tells a lot of things about her life and her family. Um, uh, so I'm not going to just like go through that. If you, if you want to know, you should look at what she says, I think. Um, uh, I will just say, So I think this is perhaps Hikaria. Um, um, she was a Hikaria Apache. Um, among other things, the Hikaria Apache call themselves or could call themselves a uh, few. It's a past tense, but when she talked about this, but they're still around. Um, Still native speakers, I guess, not very many. Um, but among other things, they call themselves Dinge, which, or, I don't know, I don't know how to pronounce it, obviously. <laughs> that should go without saying, but which means the people, right? So that's why sometimes she refers to them as she says, they call themselves the people. Um, now, like, uh, that's, it's, pretty clear throughout most of the book that that's her identif primary identification is what we say, I guess. That's her identity. This is the exact meaning of identity that, um, for example, when I lecture about Hume after this, I'm going to be trying to get people to forget and think that identity just means sameness, right? <laughs> Comes from Latin, but you know, so uh, like, I don't know, it's not a great word for that, but I don't know another word for it. Anyway, so uh, like, it's it, it's pretty clear throughout the most of the book that if you ask her, you know, who are you, she'll say, well, I'm a Native American or American Indian. She uses both of those uh terms as uh many native americans or american indians do um and specifically i'm a really hikaria patchy um even though like genetically speaking so to speak it's uh more complicated right i mean she has uh she had um more Hispanic grandparents than, than um, Native American grandparents. <laughs> um, so, uh, but, you know, I'm pretty familiar with that. Like one of the first things I said about myself when I, you know, when I was talking about myself in the first lecture, I said, I'm Jewish, but my mother converted to Judaism. So half of my ancestors, um, actually, you know, I actually got a, a DNA test, <laughs> um, and like 
exactly 50% of my DNA is so-called Ashkenazi Jewish, and the other 50% is whatever, English, Scottish, all of the German, whatever. Um, so, you know, but if you, have, but, but like, I wouldn't say I'm somewhat Jewish, or as George Santos, I just said I'm Jewish. <laughs> I would say I'm Jewish, although not all my ancestors are Jewish. So, like, I, I think that's the same. I think that's the same thing she would say. She doesn't address this explicitly. Um, and she was one of the first Native Americans or American Indians. Um, she also sometimes uses the term indigenous, um, which we just got finished dealing with George Grant's weird use of. I'll come back to what that means maybe. But um, she was one of the first Native Americans or American Indians to receive a PhD in philosophy. At least that's what it says in various places. I'm not really sure who, she, who keeps track of that. <laughs> it's, it's plausible that she was one of the first, if not the first. Um, um, to receive a PhD in philosophy. Now, adjust this a little bit. Well, that's worse. So, uh, PhD, Sophie I. Doctor, is, uh, you know, um, title that's come down to us from the Middle Ages, <laughs> the medieval, in the later Middle Ages, the, the later Latin Middle Ages. Um, uh, it's, uh, if you think of that, as I do, as a very specific historical tradition, then, um, Receiving a PhD is kind of like getting adopted into a um, tribe, almost. Especially if it's a PhD in philosophy, <laughs> right? Because we're, you know, we're the ones who still call ourselves that. You get a PhD in, you know, chemistry or something. You don't say I'm a philosopher. You say I'm a chemist. Well, um, so uh, so she was the one of the first to do that but of course but now i'm about to raise questions about this of course of course she wasn't one of the first native american philosophers so like it right meaning you don't have to be a member of that particular historical tradition to be, to count as a philosopher. Now, I mean, like in some sense, that's obvious, right? Like Socrates didn't have a PhD. <laughs> um, uh, so uh, if, you, if, if you really mean the descendants of the medieval Western European university, then um, of course that's not all of what we call Western philosophy. Whether that's a, pretty much a bad name for it, actually, I think it could be called maybe Greek philosophy or Socratic philosophy <laughs> um, uh, or Athenian philosophy, maybe. Um, but in any case, uh, um, so, you know, so then when, when you say that, well, no, okay, I'm getting myself off track. So I said, in some sense, that's obvious. It's not even all of Western philosophy, but if you mean more, if you think of it more broadly, you might say, well, is it obvious? And like, I think I said that in this, in this course at the beginning, although I have a hard time remembering what I've said in what course, but, um that you know like uh if she were the first native american ballet dancer we wouldn't say 
like the first one to, I don't know, receive a ballet certificate or whatever they have, ballet dancers have, um, we wouldn't say, but of course, you know, every culture has its ballet dancers, right? We would say, you know, no, there's nothing to ballet dancing, but that specific historical tradition. Um, so, um, so when I say like, of course, I don't know if I'm spending too much time on this because it's maybe not directly relevant, but I think it is directly relevant. Anyway, it has to be talked about somehow or other. So I'm gonna to spend too much time on it if I want to, my course. And uh, so, uh, um, uh, so but if, I, if you say, well, of course, being the first X to get a PhD in philosophy is not the same as being the first X philosopher, um, you're, you know, you're saying, well, there's more to philosophy than this tradition. Um, so philosophy, you're saying philosophy is a term more like dance than it is like ballet dance, right? Like, Every culture or almost every culture, I assume, has dance. Not that I'm an expert on this, but I think that's true, um, right? So, um, you know, uh, um, and in fact, you would have kind of a distorted view of what dance was if the only kind of dance you had ever seen was ballet dancing. Um, uh, similar, but more, Tricky example might be religion. It's more tricky for a number of reasons, but in any case, um, um, so I mean, so that's like that's absolutely necessary to even raise the question about native being a Native American philosopher without getting a PhD in philosophy or being otherwise related to the Western philosophical tradition. Um, but, uh, but, you know, there's more to the question than that, right? If, if philosophy doesn't mean this, just this tradition, well, what, you know, what does it mean? So Cordova gives uh, a lot of different <laughs> definitions or descriptions <clears throat> of what it is. Um, and, you know, she herself says, on the one hand, she says, you know, at some point I decided that I wanted to study ideas, so I wanted to be a philosopher. And that's when she, you know, um, <laughs> went to school and studied philosophy. <laughs> um, that's when she went to school and studied philosophy. But she also says, looking back on it, I realized that in the like conversations around the dinner table with my father, we were having philosophical uh, dialogues or whatever. Um, so, uh, um, so like she. She did deliberately try to study, she often calls it European philosophy. That's certainly um, too restrictive because, um, you know, like for example, Avicenna, who was Persian, was like one of the central figures in the whole history of Western philosophy. Um, uh, you know, Thomas Aquinas quotes him practically every sentence. <laughs> I, that's an exaggeration, but let's say practically every paragraph, <laughs> very often. <laughs> so, um, you know, but he lived in Persia. He wasn't a European philosopher. Um, and, you know, and he wrote in Arabic, although obviously he wrote a few things in Persian, actually. Anyway, I'm getting off track. I need to get back to, I think it's harder to lecture without an actual person. But, oh well. 
Um, so, um, um, right. So what I was saying is, oh yeah. So, so, so Cordova both wanted to study Western philosophy and deliberately set about to do it, but at least after the fact, she says, but of course that's, you know, that doesn't exhaust philosophy. So what, what is philosophy? So one thing she says, um, this is in the piece that's titled Windows on Native American Philosophy, page 54. So, um, um, I'll talk in a moment about how this book was put together. I, I, most of the titles are not hers, including, I think, that one. Um, although you have to look at the notes in the back to find out for sure which titles are hers. So anyway, this is on page 54. Um, more suitable foundations for the initi initiation of a philosophical inquiry might begin with recognizing that all humans thus far encountered have described the world sorry, have thus far encountered, have described the world. They have described what it is to be human in that world. And they have prescribed a role for persons in that world. Right, so I mean, I don't know if this is supposed to be a definition of philosophy, but she says it's a good start for philosophical inquiry. It's a way of starting philosophical inquiry without assuming that the concepts of a particular culture are the right ones. Um, so, um, Uh, so she says, well, start with this, you know, um, think about these questions. How do we describe the world? How um, should we describe um, what it is to be human in that world? And how should we prescribe a role for persons in that world? Um, those sound like they could be three like branches of philosophy, maybe, um, or could develop into three branches of philosophy. Um, she says this is a good way to start because, well, um, because all humans thus far encountered have done these three things. So meaning that if like, if these three things are, are if answering or discussing the answers, possible answers to these questions, I'm, I'm hedging that a little bit because one of the things that she says is that, you, sh you know, you shouldn't be, well, you shouldn't. Anyway, one of the things she says is that um, Westerners or Americans or some, Euro-Americans, some group like that are focused on finding answers. And she was brought, brought up to focus on questions. Um, so, uh, so anyway, like um, when you, if when you start dealing with these questions, you're doing philosophy. And if it's really true that all humans thus far encounter, and is this really something we think because we've looked at a list of all humans thus far encountered? I mean, um, so that you might have to worry, maybe tomorrow we'll encounter some humans who don't do these things. I, I don't know, but anyway, so if, if it's true that all humans thus far encountered have as cultures at least, as nations, civilizations, whatever, have 
had their own approaches to these questions, perhaps their own answers to these questions, then um, it would be true, I think, that all human societies or cultures or nations or whatever the right term is here have philosophy. Right? I I interrupted myself so many times in saying that that maybe I should say the sentence over without all the interruptions. If right, if this is a good definition of philosophy, then at least stands to reason all human societies have philosophy. All human societies. Um, because it's not clear, and in, in fact, I guess it's clearly not the case, according to Cordova, that everyone in every society or culture um, um, consciously or actively confronts these questions, thinks about what are our answers to them or what are my answers to them. Um, so, uh, um, um, but uh, it is true that that everyone is living with certain answers to these questions. And doing so, at least in part, because they're a member of a certain society. So again, this would mean that every society somehow defined has philosophy. Um, now, I mean, you might think, therefore, I'm going to just say society here. I don't think she, uh, doesn't use the term meaning that in this exact context. She says culture a little farther up the page. I'm going to say society because I mean because this should like take us back to all those people who are talking about individual ethics versus social ethics. Um, um, like you might think before we say what it is for a society to have a philosophy, we might want to say what it is for an individual to do philosophy. Do philosophy is something we say a lot now. But that's pretty recent. Um, pursue philosophy. Uh, right. So we might want to say what you know what it is for an individual first, and then worry about what you know, like, okay, so how does the society have to be related to individuals called philosophers to count as having a philosophy or as having philosophy? Ray, like, I mean, if you, you might think something similar about dance. It might be wrong about dance, just as I think Cordova and, but um, probably also a lot of the other people we read think it's wrong about philosophy. But still, you might think this about dance, right? So what does it mean for us, for a society or a culture to have dance? Well, like, it doesn't mean that everyone dances. Right, like I can't dance really. <laughs> so, um, just ask my kids. <laughs> right. So, like I can't dance, but my society has dance. Well, you know, because some people dance. <laughs> and then, like we can say, what the individual has to do to count as dancing, maybe. Can we really though, without first talking about the society? That's why I say this might be wrong. But I mean, but you might think that, right? Like you first say what the individual has to do to count as dancing. And then you can say, well, and a society counts as having dance if like certain individuals dance <laughs> in that society. And I guess you, you have to say more than that, right? The, like society recognizes their activity as dance. 
Um, so, um, but again, at least as probably as far as dance goes, but certainly as far as philosophy goes, uh, like Cordoba would not agree with that. Um, and um, probably uh, like Royce or Dewey wouldn't agree with that. Um, so therefore it does, I think it makes sense to discuss this first definition I don't know how to write this definition in, in a brief way, but I'll just say, write it these three questions. And the editors of this book, so you can, um, you can't see that using what I put up on Canvas because I didn't put up the table of context, contents, but, um, after the first two sections, which they titled Bridges and Windows, there's then there's three sections titled What is the World? What is it to be human? And what is the role of a human in the world? Um, although based on what she said here about prescribing roles, maybe it should say what should be the role of a human in the world. Um, but she herself puts the question in different ways in different places. So anyway, we have these three questions. These questions are like questions that um, at least plausibly every society asks itself and has either um, accepted answers or, I mean, she actually mostly seems to say they have answers to them, but um, despite what she says about questions and answers in other places, but I'll say like either they have the answer to these questions or they have um, approaches to these questions or something like that. And that would be the philosophy of that society. Um, now, like, question. So I said, yeah, it's plausible that every society says has this, but um, there's one society in particular you might worry about. Um, what about American society or culture does do Americans have their own way of doing these things independent of Europe so now by Americans I mean well roughly what she means by euro Americans right do euro Americans have an American answer to these questions, or do they just have a European answer to them? Um, but this, you know, I mean, this is a serious question, right? Remember, this is something like what Emerson said that we have a, still have to do, the American scholar, or that the American scholar still has to do. Um, I mean, I guess you could say, well, that was way back then. Obviously, by now we must have done it, right? But I don't know that that's obvious at all. <laughs> um, but so, um, right? So there might be a sense in which part of what's wrong in this situation is that Americans have yet to declare independence in this respect. Um, It seems like Cordova perhaps does think that. Um, although I'm not aware of a place where she makes, well, maybe not in exactly those terms. Um, not aware of a place where she really makes a theme of that. Um, Oh, 
Okay, so like, um, that, that's one answer. Here's another answer. So this is in the, the section titled Windows on America. It's in page 50. Philosophy is an activity. It is the examination and analysis of belief systems offered up as, quote, answers to the, dile to the dilemmas that human beings face. So, um, this is something that um, is not done by the society, but by individuals. Right as she she goes on to uh, discuss in the paragraph following this, she mentions basically those same three questions again. What is the world? What is it to be a human in the world? And what is the role of a human in the world he defines? So that time it doesn't say prescribe. Anyway, um, she says, there does not exist one human group that has failed to raise such questions at one time or another. Our cultures, our values, and our goals are the various responses to the answers that diverse human groups have offered up to the main questions of philosophy. And then she says, those answers in turn provide the foundation of, sorry, that's, that's not a priority. Those answers in turn provide the foundations of the actions and behavior of our daily lives. Then she says, we do not question these foundations. We take them for granted. The philosopher Martin Heidegger says of these foundations that they were once answers to open questions that are now quiescent. That is, we no longer ask questions concerning what the world is or what man is, right? So this says that in a society, people tend to, um, and there's at least, something really Heideggerian about this, although Heidegger himself was really not interested in other traditions of philosophy, <laughs> um, besides Greek and German, really. Um, so, uh, but um, uh, in a society, we tend to take for granted the society's answers to these questions. So the society has a philosophy, or at least has answers to the main questions of philosophy. Um, she puts answers in quotes, but I think um, she puts them in quotes because the way she's looking at it, and again, I think there is something Heideggerian about this. The way she's looking at it is that those answers are the quiescent questions. <laughs> They should be questions, but we're treating them as answers, something like that. So, um, so what's needed is an activity of examination and analysis of those things. Um, and that's got to be done by someone who ceases to take them for granted. Um, Is there someone in every society who does that? Is there someone in American society who does that? <laughs> um, uh, maybe, but it's, I guess, not as obvious. Um, um,
I guess we could say though, at least that um, if this is what philosophy means, then it's a kind of permanent possibility for every human being. Right, maybe no one will actually do it, but it's a kind of thing that human beings can do. Um, and assuming that every society has these answers, then there's always like some, there's always a way that you could or should be doing it. Everyone should do it. I mean, what she says at the beginning of the next paragraph is, the Native American cannot afford to forego these questions. So, um, so at least for Native Americans, she's saying everyone should do it. Um, However, it seems like there might be a kind of traditional society where uh, um, no one does this, or where if someone does it, they are not fulfilling one of the roles that the society sees for a human being in the world. Um, so, right, like what I said about dancing, that. Um, if there were a society where there was someone doing a little whatever, I told you I can't dance, but doing a little, but everyone else just treated them like they were um, um, trying to get exercise or having a fit or whatever, right? Like no one recognized that as dance. Then you might say that they're dancing but their society doesn't have dance or something like that um so like so i i, I think it's you know it's more questionable and i mean i hope it's it's clear that there's a like there's a fine line to walk here, because if you look at like having philosophers as a kind of prize to be given out to good societies, right? Then you're going to want to say it was the benefit of the doubt, right? So don't raise these questions. But on the other hand, if you're going to say, well. Um, Maybe philosophy, maybe we would be better off without it, for example. <laughs> or if not that, maybe um, there's specific reasons why we, at a certain time and place, need it. So then, if you start giving everyone the benefit of the doubt, you're like, distorting their society to make it look like yours. Perhaps trying to export your pathology to their society, right? Um, uh, so, um, I mean, like this permanent possibility might be the permanent possibility of what Nietzsche calls like getting into a fly bottle Right now, I think Cordova uh, actually quotes that thing from Nietzsche, but I, I think she understands the fly bottle as a bottle that the fly kind of lives in. Um, but a fly bottle is a kind of trap. Right? It's got like a. And I guess there's some kind of bait to like lure the flies in. Flies come in here and then um, they can't get back out again because they they don't they tend to fly up, not down. So they get trapped in here and then eventually they, they fall into the whatever you put here, like water or vinegar or poison or something, and die. 
right? So like when Wittgenstein says that his the maybe philosophy he portrays a possible role for philosophy as showing the fly the way out of the fly bottle. Um, he's saying thinking of this image where the fly doesn't want to be in the fly model, um, but it can't find its way out, even though the way out is right here. <laughs> and even though it came in that way, someone's got to show it the way out. You might show it the way out by turning the bottle over, I guess, or something like that, or by kind of like getting it. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so, you know, so like which, and this is, I think this is a good question for, for Wittgenstein. That is, I think Wittgenstein is worried about this question. Which of those is philosophy? Is philosophy showing the fly the way out or is philosophy getting trapped? <laughs> right, so, um, so that's another definition of philosophy. And then there's a third one. This is on page 60. I think there's more than three in this book, but these are the three that I want to focus on. So it's at the end of Windows on Native American Philosophy. The assumptions that serve as roadblocks to understanding the worldviews or philosophical stances of others can be overcome through the methods that the philosopher has at hand. He has made a distinction between logic, epistemology, ethics, aesthetics, and metaphysics. Those are the tools or approaches that should be used in attempting to analyze the thought of others. Not writing this up in probably in the same order she has them up, but but anyway, good enough. Philosophy, the philosopher has developed these tools. And these are the tools that can be used to, well, so like you might think these are the tools that can be used to do this. Um, and I think in a way that is what she's saying, but at, at this point in her discussion, she's like um, concluded that, that to do this properly, you have to like understand that others have other answers to these questions besides the ones you're trying to analyze. So, so how are you going to understand their roadblocks to understanding the answers that others have given to this question? How are you going to overcome those roadblocks? Use these tools. So this is a little worrying. Um, some of these terms are a lot older than others. Um, some things that in ancient times would have been put in here have been left out, like physics. Um, uh, but meanwhile, aesthetics, which is a which is a 19th century term, has been put in. Um, in other words, not everyone that we call a philosopher has these tools. By we, I mean not everyone in the Western philosophical tradition has these tools. Um, are we sure? that why well, think that every society has them? 
Now she says why you shouldn't not think that. <laughs> that is why you shouldn't think that only certain societies have. This is on page 55, near the beginning of Windows on Native American Philosophy. It is assumed that metaphysics is a philosophical activity that lies outside the capabilities of any, anyone other than advanced civilizations. Such cultures are assumed to operate in, oh, sorry, so, because I have to read this in between here. An indigenous tribal culture, tribal culture, by virtue of not being a culture like that of the advanced West, is presumed to be on a different level of development. Such cultures are assumed to operate in the realm of superstition or imagination, as opposed to the higher activities of observation, experience, and reflection. So that, I mean, that does seem like that would be a bad reason. <laughs> um, um, I mean, uh, one reason that, one way to see that that would be a bad reason is that all the supposed progress or advance that's been made, um, hasn't obviously made metaphysics any more advanced <laughs> um, than is um, um, it would be more plausible to say that about physics. or about we, what we call physics, not what the ancients called physics. So, I mean, and that right away shows that it's less, you know, that, um, we're talking about something more reasonable here. If you say what we call physics didn't exist here until the 17th century. Now, like, if we say that, that's controversial, but suppose we say that, <laughs> then um, um, it seems plausible to say, and it didn't exist anywhere else either. <laughs> but metaphysics, you know, I mean, uh, the term is not as old as the terms logic or ethics, but, um, but the book that is called Aristotle's Metaphysics is, as old as these terms. And moreover, Aristotle takes it for granted that people have been doing it for a long, whatever he's doing for a long time before him. Um, so, uh, um, so it, it, would, it would definitely be a bad assumption <laughs> that only certain kinds of societies are capable of metaphysics. On the other hand, um, like, um, I personally have spent, uh, not so much recently because I'm so busy, but I used to <laughs> spend a lot of time studying rabbinic Jewish literature, what we call the rabbinic period, like the Talmud, is what you probably would have heard of. So, um, those people were very sophisticated. They thought really complicated things uh, about all kinds of stuff, but I've never seen anything in there that looks like metaphysics. Terminology, um, they borrowed a ton of Greek terminology, but not Greek philosophical terminology um, because they didn't need it, I think, because they weren't talking about that. Um, and there certainly is a lot of superstition and imagination in the Talmud. Now, it would be wrong to say that they operate on that level, because that's not all that's there, but there's a lot of, there's like page after page about what it's dangerous to do because otherwise demons will get you. It's dangerous to walk between two palm trees, <laughs> whatever. Um, uh, Let 
later on, when Maimonides, who was a Jewish philosopher, but he, you know, he refers to Aristotle as the first teacher and and Al Farabi as the second teacher. <laughs> Al Farabi is an early Islamic philosopher, right? I mean, his his philosophy is Western philosophy, Greek philosophy, basically. Right. So, um, so later on, when Maimonides, who was a big rationalist, said, "Well, there really are no demons," some people, I don't think anything was anyone was serious about this, but some people said because he was a philosopher and a great legal authority, they said, "Well, there used to be demons, but then, like Maimonides, issued a legal opinion that there are no demons, and so they disappeared." <laughs> Right. So anyway, like I'm going through all of that to to say that, yeah, if you if you define philosophy this way, or anything kind of close to this, then it's um, it's not going to be so obvious that um, this is the prize that every society should want, that it that um, it, it looks like something that might not only apply to Western philosophy. I think, you know, I mean, it certainly seems like there's Indian metaphysics, uh, you know, logic, uh, not sure about aesthetics, but, um, right, so, um, but, uh, like I said, there isn't really Jewish metaphysics. There's no metaphysical discussion of God in the Talmud, let alone in the Bible. There's stories about God. In some stories, he seems a lot like a human being. A lot, right? So, um, uh it doesn't seem doesn't sound like the you know the most the infinitely perfect substance or something like that all right so like what i just went through was basically like a very long digression that started i mean like i planned this <laughs> although i had my doubts about it in the middle <laughs> i planned to do it and now i've done it this is all like a very long digression in the middle of saying who um Viola Cordova was. Because remember, I said she was one of the first Native Americans to get a PhD in philosophy, but of course not one of the first Native American philosophers. And then I stopped myself and like analyzed that, of course, <laughs> and tried to figure out what you would have to mean for by philosophy for it to be of course, and what if you meant that by philosophy, it wouldn't be of course. And um Um, so she is thinking about that, as you can see by the fact that all these definitions, I took all these definitions from her. Um, but I'm not sure she really confronts the issue, I mean, I guess it's not to be expected that she would confront the issue in exactly the way I framed it, right? Um, that would be, even if there were no cultural differences, that would be weird. Um, but uh, I'm not sure I see what she's doing instead. Um, and so, like, that brings me to, I better hurry yeah. up. But that, that brings me to like what I want to say about this book in general. I don't think this was this book, how it is. Um, I don't think it was, I don't think it's an ideal book to use. Um, I mean, for one thing, it's not ideal because she didn't exactly write it. So that was why, like, I put up the editor's introduction on the canvas so you can read the details if you want. But basically, uh, you know, she died suddenly and unexpectedly at the age of 65, I think. Um, 
we should have from the dates. Um, but, uh, and her husband sent all her notes to these people who ended up editing them and putting this book together. Um, and uh, I think they've done an amazing job given that that is the origin of it. However, like for the same token, the fact that they've done an amazing job is a little worrying, right? Because it means that uh, like it's, they've really done more than just stick things they found in her notes end to end. I mean, they must have. Uh, they must have done some things to smooth the transitions to, you know, if sometimes there's references back to what she said in other places. Uh, and as I mentioned, there's the titles. They've sometimes like taken one thing and a piece of another thing and put it under one title and then taken another piece of that second thing and put it under a different title. <laughs> right? So like in part of us notes the the two things were there was this and this. And they've like collected these two together and this on its own. And most of these manuscripts are not dated. Right? Like if you like if if you if you look at how they cite them, most of them say ND, which means not dated or no date, right? So like if you put this together with this, you don't know if you're putting together something that two things that she wrote 20 years apart. So, you know, I mean, having said that, I'm not like, I'm not saying they shouldn't have done this. I'm, I mean, I'm glad they did, right? And, uh, um, um, but as opposed to getting, finding a book that someone actually wrote the way we have it, this is not ideal. Um, but I think it's also not ideal because, and subject to uncertainty because of this, right? Like, I don't know what she would have said if she had finished putting this together herself. But as it stands, um, it seems to be a mixture of some things that are really profound and important and other things that are more superficial and some maybe even a little bit wrong or foolish. <laughs> um, now, I mean, um, and like, I think this is an example of the way she deals with the question, um, does every society have a philosophy? It's a good question, and I'm not saying the answer is no. In fact, I'm agreeing that some ways that you can define philosophy, the answer is clearly yes. Um, but it seems she slides from ways in which the answer is clearly yes into ways the answer is probably no without noticing that it's happening. That's, you know, um, so that, that means this is not like finished in some sense, I feel like. Now, I mean, I'm gonna, whatever time I'm leaving for myself after this very long introduction. But, you know, I mean, her book is, even though, again, she didn't write this book, but this book is the same way, right? There's a huge long introduction about who she is and where she comes from, and she explains why that's there. Um, so, um, in a way, I'm responding to that on the same level. There's this there's huge introduction about what I think about this book and how it relates to me. <laughs> um, and then hopefully it has some time to say like something about the actual views or arguments that relate to other people who read in this course. So, you know, um, Um, so I don't want to focus on the, the parts of it that I think are questionable. I mean, if nothing else, that would be I, another thing I told yourself you about myself on the first day is I'm a Mayflower descendant, right? So this lecturing to you about Native American philosophy is a tricky 
situation to be in. Um, spending the whole time criticizing for arguments would probably be a really bad, bad thing to do. Um, but, you know, um, on the other hand, philosophy is about examination and analysis. A lot of times, at least, it's about objections and replies. Um, so, anyway, I have to say something about that. Um, there are some Native American thinkers. I, you know, I don't claim to be, I'm not one of those people that she says claim to be Native American experts. <laughs> I don't, I actually don't really claim to be an expert on anything, to tell you the truth. Um, like when people ask me, what field do you work in? I say, well, I kind of a lot of fields. <laughs> but in any case, uh, uh, but getting ready for this course, I read a number of other Native American philosophers. Some of them strike me as better philosophers or more maybe more interesting thinkers, um, but they didn't fit as well into this course. One person, a contemporary person I can mention is um, and Scott Momaday. Most famous as a novelist, probably, I don't know that he even, like many of the people we study, I don't know that he even thinks himself, of himself as a philosopher. Again, right, like, should he think of himself as a philosopher? What is philosophy? These aren't the only three answers. <laughs> um, but he's probably best known as a novelist, but he also wrote a lot of essays and poetry. Um, he's a, um, uh, Kiowa Indian. Uh, I'm not sure he's still alive. I think he's pretty old. I'm not sure how active he is now. But anyway, like, found his stuff actually more philosophically interesting. Uh, but I couldn't figure out how to fit into this course. It's also it's it's quite difficult. I think. Um, so. Uh, and, you know, um, well, I'm not going to write a list of all Native American philosophers. I come to know the existence of. Um, but if you actually, someone at the beginning of this course did ask me for a list, and I gave him a list. So if you want a list, I can give you one. Um, all right. Um, one more thing <laughs> is that uh, given that this book is like maybe not ideal but um i mean like i knew when i said i was going to teach this course that they definitely had to be there should be a lot of native american philosophy in it instead i've only got this one little thing um i mean you could imagine that that would be all that would be in the course especially if you thought that american philosophy was really european philosophy you might think that if you have a course about American philosophy, it should be about Native American philosophy yeah, beginning to end. But so in any case, I knew that I couldn't have this course without something of that nature. And this is what I came up with. Um, but having gone through the assigned reading, I don't know what I was thinking when I chose. I, I mean, that. All of these I chose, I think, are good and relevant, but I think like some of my favorite or most relevant passages somehow didn't make it in. So at least one of those I'm going to read um, in a moment. Um,
So this book obviously uh, belongs in, I mean, so it would obviously belong in a course on American philosophy, if by that you meant indigenous philosophy, indigenous to America, <laughs> something like that. It would belong in a course like that. Um, but it also obviously belongs in a course on American philosophy, um, as I've chosen to understand that, because a lot of it is about America. Um, so, uh, now, like, I wrote a bunch of notes about this. I think I shouldn't get bogged down in it. Uh, the, the terminology she uses, and again, this may be because these things were written in different decades, right? I mean, uh, I, I don't know if it's like, maybe she changed her preferences of terminology, but like as the book stands, the terminology is confusing. Um, like for example, sometimes, a lot of times she distinguishes between Native Americans and Euro-Americans. Um, right, meaning these are both two different kinds of Americans. So if you said a lot of the book is about America, you would have to mean, well, it's about this and this. Now, I mean, of course, that's true. It is about both of those things, among others. But, um, but when I say the book is about America, I think a lot of the book is about America. I think I'm using America in another way that she sometimes uses it. Um, uh, as in, and this is one of the deepest lines in the book. It's certainly one of the most clever lines in the book. At the end of The Bridge to America, the last sentence is, I had discovered America. <laughs> right? You can see why I say that that's a that's a clever sentence. I uh um you know who discovered America? Did Columbus discover America? Um uh no Cordoba discovered America. <laughs> Meaning the sense before it is. The reality of my father was not the reality that I had to contend with. I had discovered America, right? Meaning she had discovered, so it's somewhat overlaps with, or is the same as this term, right? America is like Euro-America. But not necessarily that either. I mean, because at least I guess that they sometimes, this seems to include her Hispanic family um, and other um, Hispanics or Spaniards or she quotes her mother as saying, I'm Spanish, not Mexican. <laughs> because uh, New Mexico was only part of the country of Mexico for a short amount of time, right? Like between the Mexican independence and the US continent. But anyway, so like those those people, she sometimes, I mean, they're definitely Euro-Americans, right? At least they see themselves as Euro-Americans. Even if maybe if they took a DNA test, some of their DNA would come out. Um, uh, indigenous, maybe, right? But if you ask them, they say, I'm Spanish, right? Your grandmother carried Don Quixote around. I think that's amazing, actually. <laughs> I'd like to know more about that and how common that was. But in any case, um, so they're definitely Euro-Americans, but a lot of times Americans means, well, what? I mean, 
That's the real question. Yeah, question. Does an American culture, is there? Or does an American civilization, or it's the ideals of America, meaning the United States of America, but not everyone lives there. So, I mean, we're going to see a lot more and even harsher things about that in the first reading from Coates on Thursday. Um, let's see, I said I wouldn't get bogged down, and I did get bogged down. I never learn. I like my cats. I never learn. All right. Um, so, uh, all right. So, um, I take it that in that sense of America, well, is that so? Does this mean white America? Well, um, Black Americans are not Euro Americans. Whatever the DNA test would say, they're not Euro Americans. Um, um, so, Maybe yes, <laughs> or at least some of the times when he talks about it. Um, and so at, at the beginning of the, or I guess not at the beginning, in the middle of the section that's titled just America, and that I checked is not her title, unfortunately, but she says, um, so she says, an Indian working on a PhD told me, I'm tired of people getting PhDs on the information I give them. I'm getting my own degree, right? Saying that anthropologists keep like asking for information on, um, on, they're saying that anthropologists keep asking them for information on their culture and, uh, they're tired of it and they're going to become the expert themselves. But then the next paragraph, Cordova says, I, on the other hand, decided to study white people. I wanted to be a white expert. <laughs> right. So I think it, you know, like the reason I'm putting these together in her terminology here is that I take it this goes together with the thing about I discovered America. Right, she discovered America, and now she's gonna get serious and study it, become an expert on it. <laughs> um, so, um, and this is what she said happened when she tried to do this. Yeah, I don't know at what point in her educational career we're talking about here. Um, I mean, she first got a BA relatively late, and then she got an MA and later a PhD from the BA was from, I forget, I think it was in Oregon or something. But the MA and the PhD were from the University of New Mexico in philosophy. So I don't know if this was while she was already a grad student in philosophy or before that or what, but anyway, so she says, you know, um, it's, uh, it sounds like she thinks at this point, she's trying to be an anthropologist. The flaw here, of course, was that anthropological studies don't quite make it. People who are accustomed to seeing themselves as superior beings, this is on, by the way, I don't think I said this is on page 44, um, don't relish being prodded and questioned. As long as my questions were perceived as a means of learning to become one of them, I was well received. Right? So if you're asking, like, you know, oh, how do you do things here in the 
philosophy department or the anthropology department or whatever. And, and I say, oh, well, this is how we do it and this is how we do it. And, you know, that's great. You're asking really good questions, right? But she says, you know, so as long as, because I'm thinking, you know, and you're asking those questions because now you're going to try to do it too. You're going to try to be one of us, right? But then she says, persisting beyond that, right? So I think, like, if I say, you know, and this is what we, this is, what we do in a philosophy department. You say, well, why would anyone do that? <laughs> well, okay, maybe I'm supplying the tone of voice, and she, but she's saying that like, without, without that tone of voice, it's perceived as having that tone of voice, right? So you say, oh, why would someone want to do that? <laughs> then they start to get frustrated, right? So she says, persisting beyond that brought about charges of aggressiveness, arrogance, impertinence, and most of all, a charge that I had failed to understand what was being said. It seemed obvious to my artifacts. I don't know if this is, is this something that anthropologists say or is she? I'm not sure anyway. It seemed obvious to my artifacts that if I had truly understood, the questions would not have persisted. Understanding in their view being synonymous with acceptance. Right, so um, she wanted to be an expert on America or on whites, and she said, well, I'll just ask them questions like an anthropologist. And then they got mad at her because it seemed from her questions like she was trying to understand them, but not accept them. Um, right, so this is similar to, like, to what Du Bois says at the beginning of Souls of White Folk, that um, um, uh, he makes them uncomfortable because he really understands them and doesn't accept them. <laughs> That's, you know, so... Uh, um, now, however, on the other hand, you have to ask, is this how an anthropologist asks questions? I mean, isn't an anthropologist supposed to accept um, supposed to, or at least Suspend judgment, um, bracket, as Clifford Geertz says, he's consciously using phenomenological terminology. Uh, you know, um, uh, the questions of making judgments about this culture and just accept it as, a, as that they're studying and accept it as it is. Um, I mean, is Oh, why would you any? Why would someone do something like that? Now, I mean, I, I'm just making that question up, but I, I, I assume she's. I assume that's the kind of question she's talking about. Like, if you ask it that way, is that a question an anthropologist should ask? So, like, I think maybe her answer is no, and that's why anthropological anthropological inquiry won't do what I'm trying to do here. But that's not exactly the way she said it in that passage. Right? It seems she, she's saying that, like, this America, meaning at least in this essay, meaning this thing is not a suitable subject for anthropological inquiry because they'll just get really mad at you and you can't study or something like that. But, like, it, but on the other hand, from what she Concludes to do in the end. And also, what I'm about to say, what she says about anthropology versus philosophy in the end, it seems like maybe the real conclusion she drew from this is that anthropology is not what she was trying to do. Now, um, oh boy, there's only five minutes left. So there's a lot of things that are interesting that I'm not going to talk about. 
Um, but I guess, all right, so I'll cut straight to this. So, um, like, from another point of view, you might say, well, yes, that's the ideal of anthropology, that you're supposed to um, ask questions in an accepting way, something like that. Um, to any culture. So therefore also to this culture. But, you know, that attitude that um, idea for an activity came out of this culture and not other cultures. So don't you have to admit there's something unique about this culture? And if there's something unique, it could be something uniquely bad. Right? I mean, it could be that you can't treat this culture with anthropological detachments because the fact that this culture invented anthropological detachment shows that you better not be detached when you look at this culture or else what? Well, you know, it's a dissolvent, as Grant would say, right? Um, so uh, now I think like her version of this um, is most developed in this essay that unfortunately I didn't assign, which is called Against the Singularity of the Human Species. Maybe I can put it up as recommended reading or something. In case someone wants to write about this, they could look at it. So here's a quote from that. This is on page 160, a re relatively long quote. No other people except those of the West write history in such a manner. Right, so by the way, like how the West fits in with all this stuff is not, right? Like the West is not equivalent to America because there's Europe that's also part of the West. <laughs> um, but uh, in any case, so no other people except those of the West write history in such a manner. In what manner? Well, like history of the world is what she's talking about there. They may, as has China, have a long recorded history of their own, but they do not presume to be writing the history of the world. Nor do other peoples rush to collect the artifacts of ancient civilizations far from their own lands to house in their museums as the, quote, history of mankind. The Chinese do not house the artifacts of Egypt as part of their heritage. So, like, as far as I can tell, that is mostly true. Um, the museums, as far as I can tell, there's no museum in China that has a permanent, that has, like, a lot of Egyptian, there's no major museum in China that has a lot of Egyptian artifacts on permanent exhibition. Well, they've had, like, you know, King Tut or whatever, you know, something like that came through China, but, um, uh, there is actually an active discipline of Egyptology in China. Um, you could say, well, that's Western influence, I guess. There's also a journal called World History in, Ch in Chinese. Um, anyway, so, but going on with her quote, few Westerners would see the act of collecting the artifacts of the planet's people as a bit odd. Their need to document the quote, history of the world is seen as a noble act that they alone undertake because others, quote, fail to see that there is a, quote, history of mankind to be written. 
Right, so I mean, that's not exactly the same as anthropological detachment, but it's closely related to it. And it's closely related to what keeps coming up in this course, universality, universal ideals, universal uh, law of reason, the universal rights um, of human beings, universal truths of human nature, right? All of those are somehow tied up well, I guess you could say with the West, certainly with America, right? That's what we keep running into. Um, and, um, and yes, that does seem to be related somehow to the way the West wants to write the history of the world, the history of mankind, collect all the artifacts together, um, have, um, someone in our university where we give this degree that again comes from medieval Paris and Oxford to um, ideally to people who teach Native American philosophy, to people who teach Chinese philosophy, um, um, feel like that's our responsibility. Um, oh my, I'm completely out of time. But I guess, so, this is the most important point that she is saying, as well, in a different way, perhaps Thoreau is saying, that universality itself is the is the problem. That's what's that's what's wrong here. That is the the violence and appropriation, and whatever, right? Thinking that you're in a position where you're responsible for dealing with everything. Okay, I'm out of time, and next course is appearing. Um, it would be good to go back and talk about the universality of philosophy because, she, because remember, we started with philosophy being, and even the tools of philosophy being universal. Why does she think that about philosophy and not about anthropology? Um, but like I said, um, I'm out of time. So I hope some people will actually come in real life on Thursday, but anyway, I'll see you somehow later.